Julie, hey, welcome. Dad. Hey, how are you? Good. Back again. Episode yeah, seven. Ep episode seven of the breakdown, <laughs> and it feels great. I know there's probably a lot of people, at least on the East Coast, that are feeling like it's finally spring. It's warm out. So hopefully you can like take your laptop or your phone out and watch this uh, outdoors in the good weather. Yeah, we're going to have one more episode for this season. Um, this is our second to last episode ending in May. We're going to take a break for a few months and come back with so much energy in September. So as many of you guys know, Ahab is a global online cat voiceover casting platform in use by content creators all over the world. And last month we were really excited because we had finally launched Ahab to content creators outside of Penguin Random House Audio. And we now have content creators, actors, and starting to be agents on the platform from all over the world. So we're excited to see that. And we're, we've expanded beyond audiobooks into other areas of voiceover work. So if you are an actor, agent, or content creator, go to ahabtalent.com and you can sign up there. Um, we have also since launched our social media platform, so, or our handle. So if you are on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, go to Ahab Talent and you can follow us there. If you are in a booth in a studio and recording anything interesting, if you tag Ahab Talent, we will retweet you or reshare anything we can. So we just like to share everyone's work and it's good to see that everyone's been busy out there. I love the social platform just because, you know, we collected all this great information from actors and content creators to talk about, you know, how they go about their craft every day. And, you know, every day I kind of open up Instagram and see, you know, these unbelievable people like Cassandra Campbell telling us, you know, how to prepare to go into the studio. So definitely follow us on social. There's a lot of really good information there. Uh, as you all know, the Ahab Breakdown, if you've been here before, this is an extension of the platform. It's a forum where we can get a little bit closer to the acting community and where the acting community can get a little bit closer to the people who make decisions uh, in the audiobook industry or all voice industries. Um, and then also hear from really polished audio professionals. Um, Every episode is recorded and available on YouTube. If you missed the last episode, Breaking Into New Markets, Crossing Borders, you can find that on YouTube now. That was really interesting. We had someone from the UK and Canada talking about their marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, as always, attendees, if you want everyone to see your chat, change your chat setting from just um, the, the panelists to the entire group of people that are watching this. Um, and then put all of your questions into the Q&A and people can upvote them. So if there's a question you really want us to answer and we'll do our best to get to some, we know this goes by really, really quickly and we try to get to as many questions as we can, uh, upvote them and we'll see if we can, uh, we can tackle them. So Jules, we, tell us about episode seven. Yeah, we have so many questions for our guests today. So we're talking all about vocal health and self-care, which I find to be a really interesting topic of conversation. I'm really excited to learn from these guests and also hear what you guys are doing behind the scenes. So, you know, feel free to put that in the chat. Is there anything that you guys do um, to keep your, your vocal health and self-care in check? Um, so as usual, we are gonna, what, do you no, have something sorry, to say, Dan? To jump in yeah. and say, you know, especially now, given the fact that we've all been home for over a year, you know, vocal health's important uh, even when we weren't home. But I think now that we're home, it's not just about physical, but also mental care. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to talking to the panelists today. Yeah. So we, as usual, we're gonna kick off with a sample review. Dan and I found two really cool samples on the platform that may or may not have led to actual audiobook recordings. Then we're gonna dive into the meat of our conversation and finish off with VO Roulette. So if you are interested in being pulled onto our virtual stage where we will ask you a few questions about your voiceover career um, and ask, actually allow you to ask our panelists a few questions, just let us know in the chat. Um, just say something to Molly Loray and tell them that you tell her that you are interested in being a contestant kind of in VO Roulette. Um, and then we'll finally end with final thoughts as usual. So let's kick it over to that sample review. There it is. I see. There it, it is. All right. So I think so who did you pick? Yeah, so I picked Sarah Kapner. And I feel like what's really exciting about our sample review this month is just like I said, these led to actual recording. So what we're gonna listen to is Sarah's, Sarah's audition for Meet the Matza, which was one of the most fun audiobooks I uh, produced this year. So let's listen to that sample and I'll tell you guys a few things about it. Meet the Matza. He's just like you, except he's bred. 
unleavened bread. No yeast for this guy. That's Alfie Komen. He likes lots of things. He likes to go to the movies. He likes his braided best friend. Hallelujah. I don't care. Meet the matzah. So something that you got a little bit of a taste of with that uh, little sample is Sarah's knack for character voices. So Sarah actually beat out 60 other actors on an Ahab audition in order to win this role. And what resulted in, and what you didn't hear here, is it resulted in a fully mixed uh, audiobook recording with sound effects and music. And why I chose Sarah's audition is because she did a really beautiful job balancing the narrative voice with the character voices. And she also brought this just bright um, like energy to it where it kind of, it did seem a little bit more like an animation or a video game or something that I just, I just love the brightness of her voice and all of the like different levels of character voices that she showed throughout. Um, and I think what's really cool too is there were so many amazing auditions that I listened to and there were so many different directions we could have gone and we could have gone with like a more neutral character voices or a male voice but to me and then ultimately to the author Alan um she really shined out the best to us yeah what about you Dan so I actually rather than pulling the audition or a clip off of um Ahab I actually pulled the final clip from sophomores which is a novel by Sean Desmond uh John Perhala and 60 must be the magic number because there were 60 auditions for this book uh, on an open call and John Perhala was the person that we selected to read this. This is a wonderful book, uh, coming of age story, uh, takes place in New York City during the 80s. So if you're into the 80s at all, I suggest you pick it up um, and in Dallas. And what I love about John's reading is that he's really great at balancing yet again, the narrative, but all these different types of voices, but not going too far with the voices, kind of just reeling you in a little bit, but not making it almost like a cartoon, which is obviously something we always talk about on the breakdown, like remember your medium. Um, and John really gets it here. So Mal, can you play a little bit of sophomores? Odysseus is a man who is never at a loss. The gods strip him like bark, separate him from his men, exile him from his family. Yet he persists, travels to hell and back, always with a plan, without doubt never baffled. He is ever at the ready, despite his many trials. Mr. Oglesby looked over the class of sophomores, steadying himself in a lean against Teddy Boudreaux's desk. So as you can see there, yet again, John is just, you know, taking on this character of the professor, but not pushing it way too far. Um, that takes place in Dallas, and you can kind of just get a little hint of that Texas accent. Um, but John does a really good job and, and takes on a lot of different roles that are just kind of kids and adults and kind of gritty New York characters, really worth listening to if you want to really understand how, how good an actor can, can kind of navigate between uh, narrative and actual characters. So um, Jules, let's jump into topic of the month because yeah. it's something I'm super excited about, as always, vocal health and self-care. Um, Jules, why don't you introduce our first panelist? All right, well, I'm gonna introduce you to Rachel. So Rachel is a licensed and board certified speech pathologist and vocal coach who has dedicated her career to helping people communicate with confidence. She is the founder of RC Speech and Voice, a private practice providing therapy and coaching services in Manhattan and Westchester County. So if you're local, look her up. She is also a senior speech language pathologist at the Wild Cornell Medical Center. Her clients are award nominated performers, corporate executives, and professionals from all backgrounds. Her specialties include care of the professional voice, treatment of photo, oh my God, I knew I was going to screw up this word, phonotraumatic injury, gender affirming voice modification, and neurogenic voice and speech disorders. Um, I'm also excited to have her on the breakdown because she has a bit of a background as an actor as well. I'm curious to hear how that plays into her practice. And I know it does because of, she has like, a love of language. She's also uh, taught in ESL. So welcome, Rachel, to The Breakdown. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure being here with all of you. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Um, so let's bring on our second panelist, Janina Edwards. Chicago native Janina Edwards recorded her first audiobook before they were more widely known as audiobooks for the American Foundation for the Blind in the late 80s. 
Since then, she's recorded over 200 audiobooks. She's recorded with many of the major publishers, including, of course, Penguin Random House and other folks like Blackstone, Brilliant, Simon & Schuster. Uh, in addition to audiobook narration, Janina has done some promotional and e-learning work as well. She has a BFA in acting from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, an MFA from the Technical Theater from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Uh, Janina is a proud member of SAG-AFTRA and is active in the Audio Publishers Association. She's joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. So welcome, Janina. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. I see a couple people in now, so hi. <laughs> Always good to have friends in the audience. <laughs> so to kick us off, Rachel, I'm curious, how did you come to specialize in the vocal space? Sure. So I guess there's a long version and I'll give the short version today. Um, I initially set out my, my first love is classical theater. And so when I went to college, that's what I set out to do. Um, but I was torn because I also had um, some academic interest and just kind of a passion for for helping people and you know I I considered the possibility of being a psychologist or a psychotherapist I took psych 101 I hated it um <laughs> meanwhile taking all those classical acting classes um pursuing trying to pursue a career as a Shakespearean actor realizing that in the states that might not pay a lot of bills and I needed to have a backup plan. Um, and so someone introduced the idea of being a dialect coach. Um, so I started to pursue that. And then I learned about speech therapy and I realized what better way to combine my passion for uh, acting and vocalizing and communication with helping other people and uh, never looked back. Wow. Um, so Janina, now I know that you started uh, reading books for the American Foundation for the Blind, which is actually something we've suggested on, on this uh, webinar many times. If people want to get started and have never done it, it's a really good place to start. But how did you get started in voice acting in general? Yeah, so um, back in the days of yore, ha ha. Um, <laughs> my, as you mentioned, my undergrad degree is from uh, NYU in acting, um, but the the I don't know about other people, but for me in high school, you know, I was part of the theater community, the theater group, and you know, those are your peeps, and you know, we did everything, and I did tech work, and I did acting, and whatever, and um, shows out of actually applied to many schools as a tech theater major because I was doing everything, and went to NYU as an acting major, got there and realized I didn't have my peeps <laughs> no more, and I was completely intimidated by these people. There really is a point to me saying all of this. I was completely intimidated by all these actors in New York who had their photos and went to auditions. And I was, I was shy, introverted and away from home. Didn't act in anything <laughs> while I was in school. Um, I actually did a lot of dance. So when I graduated, um, as, as many people, you know, with, the, with an undergrad program, you have all these classes you're required to take. And there were things I was still interested in. So I stayed in New York. I took some classes in French and Spanish and I took a close class in voiceover, trying to find my, my space really. And I believe in that class, someone mentioned, you know, talking books or whatever, and the American Foundation for the Blind is a possible place you might be able to practice your craft. Um, I also volunteered with, I can't remember what it's called now, but it was, it was a, most states have like a closed circuit radio station for the blind where you read newspapers. And so I actually did the one in New York at that time. Um, anyway, and I called up American Foundation for the Blind and as, you know, someone fresh out of college might do said, hey, I hear you have these people who record books or something. What do I do to become part of that? And um, they said, and I'm paraphrasing, but pretty much giving you a quote. They said, oh, we aren't really hiring but if you were African-American, we might have something for you. And I said, guess what? And I don't remember auditioning, although I guess I did, but I did about five or six books for them at the time. Um, and uh, Rosa Guy and a couple other, uh, I lived off of, in Crown Heights in the West Indian community. And that's where I got a lot of my familiarity with West Indian accents and such. And some of those books had that. Um, and then um, I had my daughter and life happened and there was that gap from like 1989 until about 2000 something where I was just raising my daughter and doing what, you know, following life, following that goal. Um, and in the meantime, you know, this industry became an industry and the technology caught up. And uh, so when I, when my daughter was, went to college, when I um, had 
investigated some other things, I'd started a company called Just Right Communications and Proposals. And I'd always wanted to get back to this thing. And by then the industry completely changed. You could do it in your house, da, 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 you know, all these other things that made it possible. And um, so we sort of had the second coming of my career in the like 2010, 2011, 2012. And that's when it, things, the industry took off and, you know, timing was perfect and whatever. I hope I answered your question. No, you did. And, you know, I just want to throw something in there. You know, you mentioned you know, living in a West Indian neighborhood and just kind of listening to people and, and how it informs how you um, approach accents. I mean, I think that's, it's something I think January Lavoie also said, you know, you have to listen to people, you know, and listen to how they talk and listen to their accent. And I think it's a really valuable thing to kind of just step out of your door and go like, where do I live and who's around here? You know, um, so definitely, definitely a, a, a good tip in there. Yeah. Well, and on that note, Rachel, I'm kind of curious if your experience as an actor and in acting has informed your medical practice at all, or, you know, what's the interplay there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously a, a huge focus of my clinical work is, is treating performers, performers of all kinds. Um, and I think when you have experience as an actor, you know a lot of what the actors are facing, you know, the idea that they're there first and foremost to serve their character, you know, my, most of my experiences with stage work. So I always think about, you know, the illusion of the first time and the idea that they're really just trying to be in the moment. And sometimes when we're doing that and we're putting those things first, our bodies start to come second or third. Uh, and that's when people can really get into trouble. And so my job is to help not just rehabilitate the problem, but to help them develop these habits and, you know, sometimes to just shape the character or shape their role in a different way so that they have the muscle memory to do something healthfully so that when that actor's instinct takes over, it's not at odds with what's healthiest for their body. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's always a pleasure because you get to flex or I get to flex both my clinical muscles, but then I also get to use a little bit of those, you know, acting, acting chops that, you know, sat dormant for a long time. I wonder how many actors have, have asked to pay Rachel in theater tickets over the years for her work. I mean, <laughs> it's not terrible. <laughs> I miss, I miss those days. I wish I had those. No, remember theater? <laughs> oh. um, so yeah. Janina, you know, part of the reason I wanted you on this episode is because you've recorded a lot of books and, you know, I'm always interested in what you do to prepare, you know, maybe the day before to record a, a very intense session. You know, maybe it has a lot of voices, maybe it's going to have a lot of volume or, or something like that. What do you do? Yeah, I saw that question. I was like, I'm glad you clarified what you mean by intense because I was like, what's, what's, what does that mean? Um, I'll, I'll answer just by saying what I do to prepare. And I mean, whether whether it's intense or not, I'll throw this in there. So my goal as a narrator um, is I want, I want to do, this should be for everybody, I guess. I want to do great work. Um, I, want, I want to do great work and I want to give myself enough space in my scheduling, which is part of what I consider part of my vocal health practice so that I can read the book. Yes, I do read the book, especially if it's fiction. Good. If it's if it's not if it's nonfiction, <laughs> I may scan it, but I'm looking for the words. I've looked at that text before I dive into it. I know what I'm getting into before I start. So I read the book um, and I've given myself enough time to read it, enjoy it, hopefully, <laughs> and um, see if there's questions that I have for the publisher slash author. Um, I'm working, I'll, I'll use this one because this is, I think this is intense. I'm working on a 27 hour book right now, not for PRH, but that's okay. Wow, um, that's a lot, for anyone who doesn't know, that's a really, really long yeah. book. <laughs> so, I myself, so when I when I decided to take it, I look at my calendar and I do have a spreadsheet and I, you know, it's ridiculous what I have, but I, I spaced out three solid weeks where I'm not recording anything else. If I take that back. The only other thing I'm recording is like, I do record for Autumn and, and Apple. So I do short articles, but that's like an hour. That's, that's nothing like, you know, that's not a, another whole project. So I give myself room to dive into that book. And I make sure I have, I try to make sure I have space to just get technical questions. Like how do you pronounce 
fill in the blank. Um, and if I need to interact with the author or the publisher to say, okay, do you want me to do this or do you want me to do that? Or, or what if they actually have a feeling about it. Um, in the actual lead up, to, so I, I read it, I like to do my own prep. I like to do my own research, I should say. I have had others do it. And if I wanna give them a list to look up things, I have to look through it anyway. So I'm kind of like, you know, and if I don't give it to them, then they give me a bunch of stuff that isn't what I needed. So mm -hmm. I prefer to, I prefer to give myself enough time to prep it myself. I consider that part of my getting to know the characters if it's fiction and falling in love with them, hopefully, um, and just really diving in. And then on a, um, depending on how complicated it is, I make a spreadsheet um, and it's, I have a template on one page is pronunciation words and the other is characters. And it notes any vocal char character qualities, any plot things that I need to know about the characters as I'm developing this. And if it's really complicated, like I, I literally did do a story several years ago about a, it was a, a polyandry story of werewolves. <laughs> 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 and they were, and they were, <laughs> Romanian or Hungarian or something and they were just all I had to make a I made a you know like a relationship tree so if it's really complicated I make a tree so I I need to know who's related and how and and then I I I may play with voices beforehand depending on if the author is involved and wants to hear some things or if I just need to figure it out or if I have accents to deal with um and and then I Go in the booth. So, so that's actually, I just want to tack one question on side because Kelly Tager asked this question. I think it's really good because I, I, I once asked the pianist, you know, whether or not they actually like just crack their knuckles and start playing. Is that how they, <laughs> uh, but it's the same thing. Do you have like a really quick kind of like, do you have a warm up for your voice or is it like, do you have tea? Is there something you do? Right. So this is what I do. This is what I do. And I, one of my, my, in my PowerPoint that I will not share says you figure out what you need to drink and you drink that. Okay, this is just what I do. Yeah. I, prefer, I prefer water. This is not wine. This is actually, <laughs> this is pomegranate juice. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, this, this is warm tea. It's not hot because then I get it in the booth and I can't drink it because it's too hot and then I end up not drinking. So um, it's like usually like warm uh, room temperature water or tea. And I like like Yogi mango, there's mango, I like ginger, mango ginger, lemon ginger, ginger ginger. Sometimes I just do honey and lemon. I don't, I don't use anything exotic. When I, when I use something exotic, it messes up my stomach. And then I'm in the bathroom, I'm not in the booth, yeah. you know. Um, there's like, um, I think Yogi has like a, a throat coat or yeah. that echinacea that my body is like, what are you doing? So, I mean, do what makes sense for you. Um, but that's what I like. I do consider honestly, my shower in the morning is part of my prep because I, Rachel can tell you what is my fantasy and what actually is effective, but I feel like if nothing else, it relaxes me and relaxes my vocal areas and it hydrates and all those wonderful things. And I might do a little bit of vocalization in the shower because, you know, we all sound great in the shower. Um, and, and I just basically do a few, and I mean a few, like mm, I, maybe on vowels. Um, that sounds more beautiful than anything I could have just done. <laughs> and then, um, trained actor. Yeah, and then I, I, I go in the booth. I have I, the last month or two. I've been trying to. It seemed I felt like I was getting comments back about losing the um, ending D's and T's on things. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of um, tongue twisters that I do, and I do them slowly so that I can focus on that. And then I let that shit go. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I I get to work. Um, I, I also do some. I'm sorry. I drink like a cup, at least a cup of water before I start. And you know, I drink before, I drink during, and after, I do whatever I'm going to do. Um, but I also, oh, it, you know, if you're running, like the warm up to running is walking. Mm -hmm. So when I'm going to start my marathon of speaking out loud, I usually will read a page, and I'm listening to myself to just kind of. I feel like I'm like, it's like I'm <laughs> like, that's not quite it. Revving the, revving the engine. Water, you know, oil here, <laughs> then we go. And that's, that's pretty much it. It's not very glamorous. Yeah, yeah. Scientific. Yeah. No, but it, it's what, it's what makes you feel good. And I think that's, that's, that's the point. Exactly. 
Rachel, is there anything in there that you would also recommend or are there things that people might not realize are harmful to their voice that they might be doing? And in terms of things that I would recommend, I mean, showering, steam, steam, you know, people, it's funny. Everyone wants a product. Everyone wants like a drop, a tea, a candy. Like it's so interesting to, and I get it um, that we just want like the thing that we can buy that's going to make it better. But if you ask laryngologists, if you ask, you know, therapists and coaches and, and all of that, it's hydration. And there's two types of hydration. There's systemic hydration, which is having your whole body fully hydrated so that, you know, not just your vocal folds, but all the different muscles are getting enough water. And then there's surface level hydration. Because when we breathe, you know, our vocal folds, and if you want, we can, if you guys want to get super technical, we can play the, we can show the first slide. Yes, uh, let's do it. Yeah, Molly, coffee. bring it up. It's, um, it's so going to be so cool for you guys. So, so just quickly, where does your voice come from? Your voice comes from your larynx. Your larynx is the medical term for your voice box. Your vocal folds are these pliable bands of muscle tissue, and they sit on top of your trachea, which is your airway. And the way your vocal folds work is air blows against them, which causes them to vibrate. And that vibration is your sound. Um, but then that sound starts to vibrate or resonate against different parts of the vocal tract. So your throat, your nose, and your mouth. And that's what makes your voice unique. That's what makes your voice recognizable. That's what makes it sound like you. And as actors, you guys know that you can manipulate those resonators in different ways and different shapes. And that's how you get your different qualities of tone. That's how you get your different accents. Um, so, so that's kind of how it works. And if you think about the vocal folds sitting over that airway, they can get dry. <laughs> So if you if you've been on a plane, if you've been in the desert, I don't know where people are vacationing these days, but you, know, <laughs> you can feel it in your throat. And so taking a steamy shower or investing in a great humidifier or ingress, investing in a great facial steamer can be an important component. You know, yes, drinking water is absolutely critical. And, and what I say to people is just, you know, drink as much water as makes you feel good and makes your pee pale. Um, you know, people are very focused on like a hundred, a hundred ounces. Of, you know, there isn't a lot of evidence about how much you should be drinking. Just drink enough so that you're, you're uh, peeing constantly and it's pale. Um, but that, that humidification can really make a difference, um, especially if you're sitting in a booth and recording all day. Yeah. I mean, I know whenever I've traveled to Arizona or Las Vegas or somewhere, you know, like the level of how dry it is there, you're drinking so much more water than you are uh, when you're on the East Coast. Um, Rachel, oh, just chime in quickly. Um, yeah. Rachel, I know we're getting a few questions um, about the clickiness of people's voices and like, is there anything in addition that people can eat, do or drink um, to, to reduce those clicking? I know James Wood was asking this and a few others. My audiobook narrators and my voiceover people are always asking about clicky mouth until I started working with this like specific population of performer. <laughs> it's not something that I, at first I was like, what does that even mean? I don't, I don't know. But then when you have the experience of having such um, high tech cameras picking up every single sound that your body is producing, I mean, the articulators make sounds whether or not your voice is turned on. Like I can, that's not my voice. That's my lips making that sound. So I think people don't really like this answer. I think there's an element of like, your body is going to make noises when it moves. <laughs> and the extent to which you can train yourself to just kind of be still and relaxed, the extent to which you can take breaks and be hydrated. Um, I, I have yet to figure out like a game changing solution to clicky mouth. Do you, you have any suggestions? Well, I have yeah. I wanted to make two comments. One, going back to what you were talking about earlier. And I thought about this after our little test run the other day. Um, in addition to other things, because why only wear one hat? I teach yoga. <laughs> so um, in terms of like the answer to the question of how to fix X, people want to pill with this work, 
a lot of times the answer to the question is be quiet, rest, let your voice rest, let your body rest, get some sleep, <laughs> all of those things. Sometimes that is the answer to the question. It is not something you have to do. It's something you have to stop doing or at least give a break. So, and that's just reality. Regarding mouth noises, I definitely have them. And there's like one that I hear all the time and I'm like, I can see, you know, I can see it on the waveform. I'm like, that little quick thing. Um, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, check your mic placement also, because um, my mic is placed, I, okay, my mic is like there. So, you know, the pulls and the bulls are not going directly into the mic, they're going below it. And the, the, when I, I went from having all this mouth noise that was to some mouth noise, when I just moved it up a little bit, and I'm not telling people to go off mic, I'm just telling you to find that good placement of the mic. And you may find that that actually changes things for you. So yeah, I think I think I think I, mic placement's really really important. I mean, I think there's a you know, and and going back, I'd like to ask Rachel about foods and things like that too, because that's one of the things that, you know, after 25 years, you've heard everything in a studio. I remember like going in originally when I first started, and people saying, "Oh, if you want to restore the pH in your mouth, eat a green apple," and that was kind of like industry standard. I hear that all the time. I don't, is, so, is it real? Are, are you is telling real, us Rachel? that this is? <laughs> oh, you know what? It's really good to hear after 25 <laughs> years that that advice is not really true. And then the other thing yeah. is, you know, I think going back to what Janina said, like, do what works for you. But I remember like being in the studio with an author who, you know, we were hydrating this guy like you wouldn't believe. Like we were just pouring buckets of water in him and he was still clicky and sticky. And we ended up <laughs> using another technique a director brought in where he would uh, gargle olive oil for a minute, like 30 seconds and spit it <laughs> out. Face. And I gotta tell you, it really helped. I would not suggest it, but, and it's the only time I've ever been in the studio, but it did lubricate his mouth in a way that, uh, you know, water was not at the time for some other. Well, you know, that's such an interesting anecdote and it's very easy to be like, oh, well, I guess it's the olive oil, but it's also possible. I mean, so I work sometimes with people who are not performers. I work with people who have vocal injuries from, from all backgrounds. And there are a lot of people who develop what's called muscle tension dysphonia, which is basically hoarseness and, and voice problems just from excessive muscle tension. And sometimes if I'm really struggling to get that person out of the hoarseness, um, I will have them pretend to gargle. I'll have them look up and I'll have them go, 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 go or you know, fake it. And there's nothing in their mouth, but just that kind of lifting of the head and mm. that posture can just relax the muscles. And I think to mm -hmm. Janina's point, sometimes you need a break. Sometimes your muscles need to be stretched or they need to be exercised or they need to be relaxed. And again, we want a product. We want a thing that we can just kind of pour down our throats. But as somebody earlier said in the chat, it, it's really a lifestyle. I mean, performers are vocal athletes. And to your point, of, oh, sorry, no, go ahead, Janina. I was just going to... Um... Adding to that and going back to something uh, Dan asked, um, you know, when you're at home, you get to you get to orchestrate that. So that's, I guess, one reason why I'm like, what's intense? Because I can always stop and you know do whatever I want. But when I am going into the studio, uh, Listen Up Audiobooks is here in Atlanta, and I've had the pleasure of going to Brilliance Audio in Michigan. And there, it's like, I mean, you go in, and they were like, oh, we start at eight o'clock, and you're done at five. I was like, oh my god. And I don't usually, yeah. I usually. I usually aim to record four or five hours a day. I am I do not do, and this will answer another question that came up. I, you know, if I get two hours solid finished for the day, I'm happy. I'm not trying to do eight hour days in the booth. That's crazy talk for me at least. But if I'm in somebody's studio, um, first of all, I've let them know what I need. And nowadays I say, hey, I do five hours. I'm not sure what I would do at Brilliance, but I go in there when I say I'll be there. Um, I've got all my stuff with me, my various drinks and such. And I let them know I need a full hour for lunch. And I and that's where food becomes very, I mean, it's important at home, but when I'm somewhere else, I try to make sure I'm eating lightly. I can eat, you know, eat lightly for breakfast. I eat li lightly for lunch. I go home and I do whatever I want, but I don't want my stomach to be an issue while I'm recording. Um, so there I get very conscious of what I, I do. So I take the first half hour of my lunch, I eat, 
And then the last 30 minutes, I leave the building <laughs> and yeah. I can walk and I work out some energy. And actually during breaks, when I'm in the studio, I do some, just some stretches, not crazy, you know, just stretch my body. Um, and for me, one of the things, and it's not about vocal health, but it connects is I can't do eight hours or long because my eyes go. Yeah. I mean, I don't leave the booth and my eyes are like, I, everything's fuzzy because I've been so focused on that text. So in terms of self-care, I, I don't do, I don't, I've done that. I've been there. I don't do eight hours straight days. In and you know what? We've said this before. It's, you know, it's your job as an actor to really take care of yourself it, and, and sometimes to talk back to your clients and say, this isn't possible. You know, like I have, I work with a lot of actors who, you know, will leave at four and say, you know, I have to leave right now because I've got to do another four hours at home tonight. And I'm like, how are you doing this to yourself? And then you find out six months later, I need to take a month off because my voice is just so strained. Mm -hmm. um, but it's up to you to be vocal with the people you're working for and, and be honest with them and, and let them know that, you know, this is just too much for me to handle. Um, I think you have to listen to your body and, and, the, and let them know you're going to get a much better performance out of me if I'm doing this on my schedule. Uh, than this kind of like eight to five, which seems like a very long period, even for me, we're usually kind of a 10 to four type of situation at Penguin Random House. Well, and Dan and I are always talking about how we love to get to know actors like the 360 view. We want to know who you guys are in the booth, but also outside of the booth. So it's so interesting that your yoga practice really does inform what you do in the booth and, and keeping your muscles trained and keeping you able to have that endurance to do as much of a day that you normally do. Um, so we talked a lot about warming up, what you do in the middle. Melanie Carey wrote to us on the event, right? And she was wondering, is it important to cool down at the end of a session? Like before you leave the building, do you any, do anything? Oh, hello, kitty cat. Uh, <laughs> do you do anything to cool down your voice or Rachel, is there anything that actors or people should do to relax their voice at the end of the day? Yeah, absolutely. I think a cool down is really important. Um, if you're someone who works out, I run when I when I have time. Um, it's not like you you finish a run and then you just stand still and plop down on the floor or sit on the couch. <laughs> it, that's sort of a jarring transition, especially if you've been vocalizing a lot. It can be really important to kind of unload some tension that you may have acquired during the day or if, if things are kind of swollen down there. Um, mm -hmm. I really love a lip trill. I think lip trills are great for everything. So I often tell people to do um, some descending pitch glides on a lip trill, like a, a couple of times. Yawning can be very relaxing. So sometimes I'll tell people just to do a very noisy kind of impolite a couple of times, <laughs> or even just a little bit of humming, just to Kind of quiet things down and then be quiet don't don't talk on the phone don't you know don't schedule you know we have a finite amount of voice we just kind of assume that we should be able to use our voices and sound exactly the same for as long as we want to talk but it's a muscle just like everything else and it has limits and it needs to be rested and it needs to be cared for so i would just encourage everyone to spend their vocal cash wisely. <laughs> All of these examples remind me why I love living in New York City, especially normally, because there are tons of actors walking through the streets, performing lines, doing their vocal warmups or cool down. I, I grew up in Manhattan Plaza, so performing like arts building basically, and everyone there in the hallways, in the stairwells, you just hear people doing all of it. <laughs> Janina, do you have an, do you have a way that you kind of cool down after a session outside of just like I'm going to be quiet for an, a few hours? Yeah, I haven't done anything that Rachel just said, but but I mean, but, um, but I will be quiet. I mean, that said, sometimes I'm coming from the booth and I'm going to a yoga class, so there might actually be some vocalization, what we call pranayama or some other breath work. So. You know, maybe, but but not, but not. It was not consciously. Ooh, I'm going to do that. Chanting Om is very therapeutic for the voice. That's a lot of resonance. That's basically humming. So there's a, a breath they call um, a Kapalabhati breath or bumblebee breath, where you mm, you do this whole thing and uh, or do on potentially on different notes. So you know, 
Um, but usually, yeah, the end of the day is me coming out the booth, probably again, an unintentional yawn, <laughs> but, <laughs> but have dinner, go for a walk. Um, I am very active going hiking and whatnot. So I might go for a bike ride. None of those are what you're talking about, but, but they are decompressing from the work day. But I will be trying those, the, the, the consciously doing some bumblebee breath or something. Something that Dan and I were curious about is temperature or air quality in a booth. Does that affect your vocal health or from an actor's perspective or from your perspective, Rachel? We're kind of curious as do you notice, like, do you need to, have you been in different places where you were like, oh, it's really dry in here. I can't sustain this or. Um, the only thing I can say, I mean, that has, that does not stand out to me. If you've worked in a vocal, in a voiceover booth, <laughs> the main thing is, is it hot or not? <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, I have my water in there and I prefer not to use cold water, but I live in Atlanta. And so, you know, inside in, if it's X amount outside, it's a hundred and X and whatever it is. I don't even want to know what it is actually in the booth. And so it's like, I'm using cold water because I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to have a consistent hour of work so that I don't melt. Um, Jennifer Jill Araya, who I don't know if she's on this call or not, but um, or actually was, yeah, she brought up her, this has nothing to do with vocal health, but whatever. She uses one of those, um, the waiter, waiters have those, they have jackets that have like ice packets in them. And I was like, oh my God. Anyway, I have one. In fact, it's on the back of my chair. It's got, it's so <laughs> Show and it's tell. Got for ice pack. You put these in the freezer and you put them in here and you can go in your booth and you wear this and you stay cool. <laughs> For another, I run hot to begin with. I'm going to get one of those just to walk into the office when we go back. I, 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 I was like, oh my God. And I'm a woman of a certain age, so I can do that on my own, just like have a little personal summer moment. So this is awesome. Um, that has nothing to do with vocal health. I don't even know why I got on that subject. You know, I, I actually, oh, you got it. In the booth. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All good. Rachel, I mean, any, any more insight into that or? Humidification, you know, we're again, we're very focused on temperature. And I think if you're physically uncomfortable, well, it's a lot harder to be vocally comfortable, especially for prolonged periods of time. But just from a vocal health standpoint, you want it to be, you know, humid enough so that you get that surface level um, hydration since you're doing a lot of talking in there. Mm -hmm. Janina, when, when you're creating a character, and you know, maybe you have some cues in the text. Maybe the character is, you know, a large man, you know, with a very gruff voice. You know, are you preparing um, your your voices for that project and thinking about vocal health when you're saying, you know, what I can't sustain that voice for that character for 400 pages. Like I've got to come up with something that's maybe a little lighter. Are you thinking about these things when you go into a recording? I do now. <laughs> I did um, one of my first books that I did. It actually was the opposite. It was a female character, and it said it had she had a baby doll voice. And I remember I just threw the voice, and and then you know she she was a character that went through out. And I remember um, the I had a director, and you know the next time the character came up, I like brought it down a little bit more so that it was like it's something I really wanted to do. And she's like, I think you were higher, and it's like. <laughs> and so I had to and I could do it but I was just way up there and I don't know I, you know I'm, I don't go back and listen to stuff uh, usually but um I don't know how that sounded to the audience but I'm like I don't know about that but also now I'll be like yeah we just you know the, I think it's okay um I mean there's many thoughts about how you do character voices and I know you have PJ Oakland coming next yeah. time yes we and do I, and I, you know, been doing this before I took his class, but I took his class back in the fall and that was wonderful. And in terms of vocal health, I think, you know, using all of the tools you've got, which are not just pitch to create that character, you, that's where you want to go. And that's going to help protect your, your, your voice. Um, so use all of your tools. They're not just pitch, even just pacing. Some people speak yeah. slower. They think a lot you know there's there's so many if you're and if you're just doing basic acting following the emotional through line of the character those two people in the scene are going to sound different because they're not coming from the same place so I do think about my vocal health in terms of portraying character 
Um, one thing I hear people talk not talk about when they when they discuss that kind of thing is, and we can't do anything about this as, as narrators, some authors, especially in romance novels, like the man has a deep voice and it, and it says, it says he has a deep voice. And then this one author I'm working with right now, I've done a series by, and like the next book, he had a deep voice. And I was like, and they were in the same scene. So it's like, oh, like no, okay, I, I can't, I can't go any deeper. And she was involved <laughs> in the process. And so she's like, well, could you take it a little lower? And it's like, no. <laughs> so I think it's- That's important. when you ask your editor to pitch it down for you. Yeah, it, right. And so in, for me, it was like, okay, how do I give a, how do I give them a different quality that's gonna distinguish them but I, I can't go any deeper. So yeah. I think it's I think it's important to know all of your tools as a as a narrator, as a as a voice actor, and use them all to distinguish those characters. Um, um, I think I answered your question. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important. Just like I say this all the time, just like when you're sitting in the booth or in the uh, in the control room, and an actor says, "Oh, I have this great character voice, and I'm going to do this," and they go do it. And you're like, you can't use that voice. You're never going to be able to sustain mm -hmm. that for three or four days. It's going to ruin the rest of the recording for you. But a lot of actors are now working from home. And I don't think they're made consciously making those decisions if they're not working with a director where the director's like, pull it back just a little bit because you have a, you have a lot to record in the next couple of days. And again, if it's a series, you're going you're gonna to come back yeah, to the thing. Exactly. I think that's such an important point and that is what I tell my clients that whatever choices you make need to be sustainable whatever you're working on like if you know with my Broadway people I say well if you book the role and you're starring on Broadway eight shows a week and you have to do this over and over and over again don't create a problem for yourself um, and same thing if you you know do a project and it's a series and they love you and then you're the voice and I think that example of that really high voice is, is such an important um, you know, cautionary tale for people. Use all the tools in your toolbox to create something that you can produce comfortably and that you can replicate. Um, if you don't feel like you have the tools, find a coach. You know, this is this is where vocal coaching can really come in handy you know there are other ways to convey a deep voice without I mean just physiologically your vocal folds don't vibrate like you know a six foot tall male they they just you can't do that you can do other things to give that illusion and again that's where coaching or editing <laughs> can be can be very helpful I know we're about I was, to on so I wanted to make 2.1 yeah, I think it's also, it's okay for you to use the author's words to tell them that that voice is deeper without you going there. I mean, there's, again, there's, if you hear Scott Brick or others talk about, they do very subtle things and sometimes they don't do that thing. They just, and you feel, and let, we let the audience fill that in. And then the second thing, um, I won't get to show my PowerPoint, but I wanted to say one thing that, I, and it echoes what Rachel was saying, and this is coming from my yoga experience, but it's, it's, it's the same thing. I, I do ask myself in life in general, but definitely in this, does the choice I am making include taking care of myself mm. when I'm scheduling, <laughs> when I'm accepting a role, when I'm choosing the voices, am I in there somewhere in that picture? Is my vocal health, is my enjoyment of the, the process of the book? Is that in there somewhere? And if it's not, then my priorities are not in, in how I work out my, narration you know, recording schedule for the day is walking in there somewhere all that stuff that should be part of it and I lost my third point but we'll come back to it I'm sure you'll you'll come back you just call it out you can jump right in but okay. I think that's such a good point so so many of us including myself we you know we're going on to the next thing and the next thing and sometimes we just need to take a pause and think about things and see how it's affecting the rest of us. Uh, one last question I wanted to get to before we move on to Via Roulette is uh, Anna Itova, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, she asked, what if she's raspy in the morning? How can she treat that? Um, and I know we've talked about steam. I know we've talked about um, get, taking a shower. So Rachel, what would you recommend? Sure. Um, so I think you know, there are a variety of reasons why we might be raspy in the morning. Some of that could be dryness. If you're a person who lives in a really dry place, um, if you're someone who sleeps with your mouth open, 
you're gonna wake up and, and there might just be a lot of dryness. If you have sinus issues or allergies, there could be post-nasal drip. It could be acid reflux. If you're someone mm. who suffers from that or you're a late eater, maybe you had some wine before bed, <laughs> maybe you <laughs> ate or drink and then you know went to bed really quickly. So there are kind of behavioral reasons. It could also be that you're taking on too much um, and that you're not necessarily warming up your voice before working, that maybe you're making some unhealthy choices in terms of how hard you're using your voice, how long you're using your voice. Um, so I would experiment with lifestyle changes, but I would also, if this is a chronic problem and you can't get rid of it, go to a doctor. Um, I think hopefully people remember a lot about what I said today, but if you don't remember anything else, you need to find an ear, nose, and throat doctor, an ENT. And more specifically, you need to find someone called a laryngologist. So an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, is someone who you know, deals with ears and noses and throats. They might not have the same level of expertise as a laryngologist who is just the T. They are someone who only specializes in vocal cord disorders. They have specialized equipment. They know what they're looking at. They are more likely to be treating performers and have a sense of what you're up against. They're more likely to be able to put you in touch with a therapist if necessary, who specializes in this because speech pathology is a, is a wonderful field. It's very broad. Not all speech pathologists are, are trained um, in, in voice work specifically. So, you know, gen a general rule of thumb is if you're experiencing voice changes for two weeks um, or more, you should be going to the doctor and uh, getting that looked at. Great. I'm uh, seeing an moment in my house. Uh, <laughs> little <laughs> kiddos in the back. This this is the pandemic. This is this is my reality. <laughs> <laughs> so they they went up first thing because I've locked myself in here, but they, they <laughs> did manage to make a, uh, a voiceover appearance. <laughs> They're trying. I did want to make um, uh, one comment. Oh, yeah. And, and this is whatever Rachel can say if this is again in that fantasy world of what actors do to think they're helping themselves but um at one point I did use I have it by my bed but I don't use it. I have a humidifier a humidifier just one of those personal mister thingies a miss a mister as in well they're both spelled the same way anyway it mists at night <laughs> um um so you just have the you know it's not like the Vicks vapor rub, it's the other way. Just getting some air in there. I was told that, you know, again, you, you, you dry out at night. I'm using civilian words for this. And so I tried that. I didn't feel like it did anything, but it was something I tried. I, I don't do it often anymore, but I saw someone that mentioned like the pot on the stove with the steam. I loved how that felt. It just felt like, and I did actually use that. I think since I have been much more mindful of how much I do and don't record, I don't wake up with that same level of roughness in my voice but I did use it one time when I was asked to do a smoker's voice and I didn't know what they wanted and when I finally understood what the the rights holder wanted I got up first thing in the morning <laughs> I didn't take a shower I didn't drink anything I went right in the booth and did all those lines were like oh, it's like it was perfect <laughs> so I was able to use it Hey, I, th go. I thought you were going to get into some method acting. Usually I woke up, I smoked a pack of cigarettes. I went right into the booth. That's how I did it. If you get me first thing in the morning, you don't need, I don't need a pack of cigarettes. It's like, oh. <laughs> um, well, I think it's time to move on to VO Roulette. So let's get someone up here. Um, Doug Ramsdell, I think you are our VO Roulette contestant today. All right, Molly, bring on. Come on, voice of God. <laughs> I've never won anything before. <laughs> you won today. Well, hi. Hi, hey, Doug. Rachel. How are you doing? Doug, it's so good hey, to see you? you. Oh, my goodness. So, so, Rachel, you know Doug. Yeah, I consulted with uh, Rachel when I started doing audiobooks because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And... I basically just needed a um, grounding, what to do, what not to do. And I put in the chat that uh, her warm ups and her cool downs go into the booth with me every day. And Aww. it's it's made such a huge difference. It really is. Uh, yeah. So Thank great. You. That's so great. Yeah. It's so exciting to see you again. 
again. It's been a while. No that's, no the thing. that's what I tell patients or clients. I say, you know, if we do this right, you're not going to see me again. <laughs> That's always so sad. You guys were yeah. mentioning ENT. It's like, I'm cured. I don't have to see my ENT anymore. He's great. That's you guys need him. I'm fond of saying that our job is to put ourselves out of the job. <laughs> <laughs> so Doug, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and what's your acting experience like? Uh, well, I've been, I've been living in New York for about, oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> and I trained as an actor for a long time at the Barrow Group and did a whole bunch of, uh, you know, the usual classes and seminars that, that, that people do. Um, I also worked in publishing initially in New York as a temp and ended up working at an agency that did Random House's advertising. So I did Random House's advertising for a few years and that involved print ads and it also involved voiceover. And so I wrote, produced, and directed tons of uh, radio spots for Random House Trade, Adult Trade Division. Um, got into audiobooks, thanks to Robin Miles. Got to Dr. Salika, uh, who is the ENT who got me to Rachel through mm -hmm. Robin Miles. And um, right now, I'm, I've basically been working at um, the Library of Congress, National Library Service, doing whatever comes over the transom. It's, it's an amazing spectrum of stuff I get to do. So and it's, it's a and lot it's of fun. That you, you got to work with Robin. I mean, she just won uh, best audio, female audiobook narrator of the year at the audience. Yeah. Year, yeah. Super talented. Yeah. I got to go observe Robin in the booth. And so that's where my booth deportment comes from, my sense yeah. of what you do and what you don't do. And when you go, oh, wait a minute, I fucked that up. Wait a minute. Um, it was great. So when, you know, because we're talking a lot about vocal health, what is what is your day like as far as like, how do you take care of your voice before you go in and, and when you leave the booth? Well, like I say, I, I have a, some, a list of uh, voice exercise, br brief voice exercises that I got from Rachel. Um, when I'm in the booth, I have this, which is uh, sort of a handy. <laughs> yeah, it's blowing a straw into water, which gives a certain resistance to the voice. And Rachel can explain mm. why that's important. But I, I kind of do long days and I kind of, because it's not my studio, I kind of tend to keep going um, probably when I should take a break. But that's kind of the nature of the business there. Um, so that's Rachel, about Rachel's about to book you another appointment right now. So. <laughs> oh, this is like the most gratifying. It's like a, he got a pop quiz. Like, how much do you remember about everything? Well, I've got, uh, <laughs> I've got uh, my notes here, which are transcriptions oh, of our yeah. sessions. Because I also it's recorded so our, I recorded our sessions because so much comes up in these sessions that just goes, psh, yeah, <laughs> in and out. So. So I know you learned a lot from Rachel. Do you have any uh, like lingering questions for either Rachel or for Janina about vocal health or or go wherever you want to go? <laughs> well, I actually put a, I put a question in the chat and um, it's I just ran across not too long ago a bunch of YouTube videos that are intended for people that are transitioning from one gender to another. And they're essentially exercises to get one sex of, I hope I say this right, one sex of person to sound more like another, the sex of person that they want to get to. And I just wanted to ask, Rachel, do you, is that a legitimate thing for voice actors to do, do you think? I, I, that's such an amazing question. I saw it in the chat and I feel like we could have an hour long discussion just <laughs> on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's such an interesting area. So a, a huge component of my work is gender affirming voice modification, um, where you're training someone to use their voice in a way that matches their gender identity. And you are going through exercises and training, you know, different techniques to help them shape their, you know, I can't change the way their vocal folds look, but I can change the way they modify their vocal tract. And so, you know, to this point, Right now, there's a lot of information on YouTube, and as you know, I haven't spent tremendous amounts of time going through the videos, and so I'm always a little reluctant to say, "Yeah, sure, whatever you're looking <laughs> at is probably fine." Yeah. 
Um, because I think a lot of those videos are people doing things that have worked for them and for their bodies and all of our bodies are different. Um, you can play around with, I think if you're someone who knows your body and you know that if something feels strained, if it's making you hoarse, if it's making you raspy, if it's making you tight, um, or causing any kind of discomfort, you shouldn't keep going with it. But I do think that there are a lot of applications of gender, or rather there are techniques that we use for gender affirming voice modification that could also be really useful for actors who are trying to portray characters of a different gender. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm curious, and I, I don't have a comment in terms of the value or not of those videos, but you know, one of the things that we and I don't know, the industry or whatever have to be mindful of is like, you know, not all females are higher and not all males are lower. So I, I don't know where that falls into this because I'm a, I don't know, you know, when it's gender affirming, as long as it's not, as it's not meaning it's affirming that all women are like this and all men are like, because it's, that's absolutely not the case. And that's one yeah. of the reasons why what we were talking about earlier in terms of like, you know, characterizing male and female voices or going deeper for males is like, not all male, not even all sexy males are low voices. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I would be, I'm expressing more curiosity than anything else about how that, how that works in terms of affirming someone's gender, but knowing that that doesn't mean it's higher or lower. That's yeah. such a great point. And even when we're working, so right now I'm kind of giving you guys a little bit of a glimpse into a very different kind of coaching um, than, than what I would be coaching my, my VO clients for. But one of the first things we say is pitch is not everything. Like if I start talking like this, I don't sound, I sound like a woman <laughs> who is trying to use a low voice, right? So, uh -huh. you know, and we joke the opposite that a man can speak in falsetto and that doesn't mean that we perceive him as a woman, we just perceive him as speaking in high guy voice. Um, so I think it's less, for the case of narrators, it's less about pitch and it's more about all those other techniques. Like what about resonance? If you're a male narrator and you have like a very chesty tone, can you work on brightening your tone and increasing like your forward focus? If you are a female author, um, or narrator and you have a very bright tone naturally, can you work on kind of like rounding out your tone and making it chestier so mm. that you're kind of, you're not really lowering your pitch so much as bringing out different formant frequencies um, mm. and just giving it a different color, if that makes sense. Yeah, also I Robin did had a thing that she, uh, she, she would always physicalize her guys. Yeah. And her guys would always be if there was if they were guy guys, she'd sit straight up in the chair, she'd throw her chest out, and she'd throw her legs apart, the way guys do when they sit on the subway. And you, you know, you could just sort of feel that sort of maleness coming out of her when she did that. And it talks a lot about Wonderful. that. Yeah, and, I, and my advice on top of that is again, listen to the great audiobook narrators. You know, I mean, listen to as many great award-winning narrators as you can because they've mastered these techniques at this point. But yeah, it's historically in this industry, it's hilarious to bring in a, a guy reading for the first time and, you know, they pitch themselves up. And I'm like, do you, that's offensive. Do you know any woman who speaks that way? You don't. <laughs> so why would you do that? Listen to people. So then maybe I think the answer to your question, Doug, is watch the videos and see how it impacts the people who are using those techniques. And if maybe, you know, based on what you're hearing, if that's something that you might want to play around with, play around with it. If it feels comfortable physically and you can sustain it and replicate it without any kind of, you know, negative sensations or sounds, add that as a tool to your toolbox. But that's also, you know, a good reason to find coaching. Um, if you if you feel like you can't you can't shape that sound in a sustainable way, um, get help. Well, thank you, Doug, for coming up. I'm so happy we we're able to make this little reunion. This is so exciting. Um, such a treat. Yes. <laughs> you know, I always love see I always love seeing you, Julie, because you remind me how much fun publishing was when I was working Aww. adjacent to it. It's it's great. <laughs> 
It's great. <laughs> you you know I drink Thanks, the Kool Aid hard. I love of, it. You know I'm a lot of fun too, Doug. I gotta tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember the, the third thing. <laughs> oh, we the, the third thing, Jenny. So, you know, sometimes people are like, I can't. I don't. You know, I don't get to have directors. I don't have a coach. You know, you know other. You will know other actors, and you probably know other actors who who may have experience with directing. I have the pleasure of working with Janet Metzger here in Atlanta, and we. She was one of my first directors. Mm -hmm. She actually is in my neighborhood-ish. And um, I worked on an audition and I said, Janet, you know, can you help me? And we did, I, I paid her, but not what she normally was paid. And I also know someone who's an artistic director who also does audio based. She directed me on something as an exchange for watching her cat. So, I mean, you may know <laughs> people that can give you some of what you need even if they don't stay with you for the whole project, just like get you started through the first day hearing what you're doing or, t you know, giving you some feedback on the character voices you're creating. So you do have, you may have access to more than you think you do. That was my point. Great. Great. Well, um, I think we're gonna move on to final thoughts. So Doug, we hope to see you soon. And thanks for coming to the breakdown. Thank you, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you. <laughs> so for Rachel and Janina, I guess we'll, we'll start with Rachel. Do you have any final thoughts that to share with the audience before we wrap up? Oh my goodness, we could talk for another hour. I know, it went by so quick. So much we could talk about. Um, <laughs> don't go looking for a food or a pill or a product. Um, look to your habits and your routine. And if you feel like things are, are not working or there's something that you wanna improve upon and, and you're not really sure how to go about it, just seek help, whether that's from a coach or from a laryngologist. Um, don't don't just assume that you can eat something or swallow something and it's it's gonna you know make it magically go away. Um, Great, and my, Janina, I, what do you got? I am going to give everyone within the sound of my voice permission to say no <laughs> to overscheduling. <laughs> to I mean, you do you know, to making more space in your production schedule in your life so that you can do really great work and enjoy this work. You have my permission not to do eight hour days. Amen. <laughs> Dan, what do you got? What's your final thought? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop on with what Janina said. I mean, my, my advice is don't bite off more than you can chew, uh, whether it's with a character voice that you're about to perform in a series of 1000 page novels, uh, or as Janina said, I will agree with her. Don't bite of more than you can chew when it comes to the work. Uh, talk to your clients and make sure that you're being fully transparent about what you think you can do and take care of yourself more than anything. Because, you know, the worst possible scenario is that I discover you on Ahab or I'm like, I want you to play this role in this book I'm working on. And you're like, I had to shut it down for two months because I took way too much you know, I spent way too much time in the booth and over the last three months. So take care of yourself. And I learned that green apples do absolutely nothing, but great superstition. Keep it in your back pocket. I can't um, wait to share that with everyone. <laughs> I, I think mean, it's actually perpetuated that on this. On and this they maybe make you produce more saliva, but they're not doing anything for your vocal folds. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. Um, well, it's so great to have you guys on. So I'm so grateful that you guys made the time. I know our audience and I learned a lot. So um, thank you guys. Dan. Can I just ask Molly really quickly to show the very last slide. There was a question in the chat about where yeah. you can find me. Oh, of course. If you have any questions, um, you can find my private practice. You can find my website and you can email me at rcspeechandvoice at gmail.com. Great. Yeah, you guys will be so lucky to get to work with Rachel. So I'm bring so back your stories. It's a <laughs> community of people. I, I love my my narrators and my VO folks. You guys are all delightful, all of you. <laughs> Great, over to you, Dan, then where are we going next month? All right, so episode eight of The Breakdown will be Mastering Dialects. This is something we've been kicking around for quite a while, something we want to cover before we go to the summer so that everyone can take their, their homework back for the whole summer. Um, but it will have will be uh, on May 13th at 4 p.m., 1 p.m. Pacific with PJ Oakland, who many of you know, uh, and Will Demerit. So I'm really excited about this episode.
yeah, it'll be our last one of the season. So please come tell your friends and we hope to see all your guys' faces there. And uh, if not, we'll see you in September. All right, Thanks bye guys. Everyone. Bye.